Christine's we getting high, it. everybody. Just a PSA. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> I'm watching Listen, her before my very eyes. Things get... are changing around here. Like, Not really. Like the receptors in her brain. <laughs> Here's the thing. I found this legal weed, okay? And I mean legal because I live in Kentucky. Normal right. weed is not oh, legal. I totally forgot. I was like, why yeah. are you... I was like, you were saying like... Oh, I, I hope it's okay. And I was like, I don't give a shit. I totally forgot oh, yeah. you're not in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is it is uh, not legal here recreationally or medically. Isn't that fun for me? Uh, mm. And uh, I found through some podcast ad, I don't know, like THC8 and THC9, which are like lower. I, I don't know. There's like some, it feels like a loophole because it still has like the THC effects, but it's just l- less. Mm. So I started using them as like little sleep gummies at night and they work wonders and it has helped me cut back on my drinking, which is great because like oh, nice. if I'm going to bed, I don't need to like keep drinking. I mean, listen, you know, it's fine. My ther- By the this way, my this is not is an for. ad. This is all no, we've it's, about not. So far. it's not. It's not. And I haven't like even said a brand. I'm not going to say a brand because I'm, you know, whatever. Um, But uh, so I found these fun little like THC eight, like, uh, I don't know, gummies and like this little vape pen that Blaze keeps making fun of because I'm like, let me grab my vape. (laughs) It looks like a little office highlighter or something. It does, doesn't it? And then I've been labeling them. Jack Herrer? That's the strain of it, apparently. But then I put little symbols for what it does. So this one apparently is good for creativity. So I put a smiley face. My label maker doesn't have that many symbols. So I put a smiley face and a pencil. I was gonna say this is the most like mom version of getting stoned. I know. It's, it's like let me use unhinged. my label maker to organize <laughs> to how it makes me vapes. feel. <laughs> and like to be clear, I was never. It's probably obvious. Never a weed smoker. Like I just didn't. I drank way too much. But like I never really smoked. I was never against it. I just never did. And so the first time I did was in Colorado where it was legal and. I got w- way effed up and I accidentally <laughs> took way too much of an edible. I was like, never again. So it's taken me like almost a decade to like really come ease back from back. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like really traumatizing. <laughs> so I'm back, baby. Um, I'm redoing my office M. Um, I have my Mothman collection back there. Um, I put a mini fridge up here with all my with all my water beverages yeah, you i mean said, it's... you said oh let me get my liquid death from my corner and i was like what <laughs> yeah, corner yeah, i know are you talking i was about? gonna say from my new mini fridge but i was like i want to announce that on the podcast so i'm gonna say corner <laughs> is it the same mini fridge from your old house that kept that... no we uh, get we that one got backs i just like couldn't move it with it so um i ordered a new one off walmart.com sorry also not an ad um <laughs> Is that so? Is that why you're not sitting on your couch anymore when you record? Because yeah, so, you've got a whole wall now. Well, so here's the thing. I've also been working on that corner, Ooh. and I put up some shelves and some pictures, and I've been trying to put my books up, and I'm slowly building that together. Is that Junie? Oh, there he is. Hi, June. Um, <laughs> is that a dead cat in the middle of my room <laughs> <laughs> yep that's juniper for you um but so when i record beach to sandy we film it like with cameras mm-hmm. um and so i usually sit there and so every time i would have to like swap all the cords and since we do it over zoom so i was like you know what i'm gonna have it and that's where you drink recording station mm-hmm. which has fun things like this And then I'm going to have my corner over there for uh, Beach Juice Handy. So uh-huh. Very nice. listen, it's I'm I think I'm thriving. I don't know. As the episode goes on and I keep trying out this fun little machine, you let me know if I'm getting a little too out of control. Um, how are you, Em? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'm fine. I'll be the exact same amount of not stoned by the end of this. Um, so <laughs> oh, man. I only know that PSA where like the girl's like melting into the couch. That'll be you by the end of this. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, I was always like, that looks lovely. Yeah, Why do they want great. me to avoid that? I was Sounds like, like a good nap. <laughs> the way my brother taught me the two strains, because he has a medical marijuana card in Ohio, is um, so there's sativa and indica. Mm-hmm. And indica is like in the couch. Like mm-hmm. you're like, it's like the mellow, like make you sleepy kind of thing. Right. Anyway, right. that's that's how I learned. Fun well, fact, that, everyone. That's clearly what that melting girl was on. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always think of that. I'm like, yeah, in into the couch physically. Um, uh, other than that, I'm fine. I've I not much to report here. I don't think. 
Oh, I got a present from your girlfriend. I got a package today and it said from Allison. And I was like, huh? And I opened it because I was like, oh, she just went to Iceland. Like maybe it's a souvenir. And then I opened it. I was like, this is amazing. And then I read the card and it's for my birthday. So (laughs) oops. But when this comes out, as we messed up last week, as this comes out, I think like in a week or two is our birthday. So, you know, Mm -hmm. it sort of counts. But she sent the sweetest little card. It says, have a wicked birthday with like this (laughs) creepy demon on it. And I love it so much. (laughs) And then I'm sorry. Look at these freaking matches that are like little elephant guy. Like these cool vintage looking matches. And then, um, what? A lucid dreaming kit. I was with her when she got that. That was from the Renaissance Fair. Oh, um, I was like, wow, M's. If if M was not involved in this, M has someone. Uh, what do you say? Run for your money. How do you say that phrase? It sounds right. Giving you a run for your. Al's giving you a run for your money with the, with the gift giving because I gasped when I she opened this. She did tell me all about these matches, and I never got to see them. So she and I kept They're beautiful. Being like, well, I didn't know what was going on. I just kept being like, you sent her matches for her birthday? Okay, I was like, <laughs> I've gotten a lot of matches for gifts recently, and it's the best because they're like just the most beautiful container, and then you can replace the matches. Oh, Nobody I didn't even think about that. has to know that there's not the original. Genius. Yeah, these are so cute. So you thank you, You can also make Al. it a little, a little tchotchke box. I love a tchotchke box. Or a little box. tchotchke box. Um, and, but this this little kit you has like You can put all a... your little vapes in there. Oh, come on now. We're Which talking. is the digital match book. The t- digital <laughs> yeah. matches, right? Who needs a match? Match. <laughs> that's a great point em. um no i was with her for the renaissance fair when she got uh god it's so cool i mean it has dream the- tea and oh anyway i just i just saw it on my desk so thank you al pal um, I, that was so- I- you're the first birthday gift i got al thank you uh she's been really on a roll recently with her um being productive yeah she- i mean she uh, like she mailed it out like a month before my birthday i know she's traveling and stuff but i was like damn She's having a bit of a crisis these days with um getting tasks done, and so I think she had like, uh, she was in a panic state. One for, of those like, yeah, she was like, I need to get everything done because then, because then I'll relax, and and it's like, okay. don't you love that? It's then like, you need your indica, you know, to really relax. That's God. what. She, maybe that's what I'll mail her for her. Birthday. I was gonna say Allison could probably <laughs> use some indi- indi- couch. I think indica. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, she's a uh, she's been trying very hard she texted me when we were like in boston or florida and she was like i already got all your birthday presents and i was like wow whoa like that's not for a while i hope i didn't just spoil all your gift oh no you you already knew about these okay good good allison if you got me matches uh, well i'm sure they look very pretty apparently but (laughs) i was like how do i go about this delicately (laughs) i don't know if i want matches please um but no i she seems to be really on top of it. it And she said she's, I'm excited to see what she got me. She said this is the year that she feels the most confident in the gifts <gasps> because she's always kind of guessed before. So, uh, the, Okay. She's putting a lot of pressure on, though, because if it's not, then you're going to be like, really? This if, is if the it, bar? If she was really confident about the matches, I'm so sorry, Allison. <laughs> I was like, I what? Was like, oh, if, about matches for you. I was like, she got me she, I was like, that's a great gift for me. I gasped when I saw those. They're beautiful. The design is very you. Almost. I love matches for like, that's a big gift, Em. You got to get with the times. It's good candles and they're decorative. Uh, we honestly, we have so many candles that need to get lit that a box of matches wouldn't be the worst thing that I get for. Uh, See? You're yeah. coming around. <laughs> anyway, I I'm doing good. Uh, nothing really to report here. Um, I'm, it's about to get busy, so like I'm really trying to appreciate this like week I have at home. And then it's like I feel like I'm traveling nonstop until like the end of summer. And then we'll RJ's be back wedding, on tour. yeah, Vegas. What um, else you got? So I have I have the Philippines, which um is overwhelming to me because I don't do well with international travel. So that's bigger in my mind than it actually is. Um, and it's one of my best friends getting married, which is also a, a big deal for me. Um, mm-hmm. what else then I've got, we've got Vegas, but that's very quick. Like, I think I'm only there for like 24 hours, it seems. Yeah. And then I'm going straight to the Philippines. And then, uh, when we get back, oh, then it's my birthday, but my mom's in town for my birthday. Oh it boy. Was not fully invited to my birthday, by the way. She just is attending. Um, she just said, I'll be there. <laughs> um, and then after that, I have like a bunch of people coming into town. So it's really not going to be like, like I have, um, this is so gross, more health stuff, but I have two surgeries on my stupid legs in June. What? Oh no. I know. They're taking have, them off? 
I'm taking I'm taking some gross veins out. Oh, oh, oh yes, we have talked about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I have that at the same time that I have friends coming into town. So I'm wondering how that's going to go. And then in July, I'm going home for a while. Uh, I'm also stopping in Florida to see my grandma. And then in August, oh, I'm seeing you at some point in June. And then in August, we've I've got something else going on and then we're going to be back on tour as as oh my god so. yeah i'm going to sweden in august and i'm beach to sandy has six or eight live shows it, throughout I the feel, summer i feel very <laughs> nervous for you oh at some point i want to come to one of your shows so that'll be oh, on the docket that would too. be so fun if you could yeah i'll send you the list um by the way folks check Shout out, out. beach to sandy.com slash I don't know, something. Just go there because there's tickets. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to a lot of cities that um, Em and I haven't gone to in a while and a lot of places that we have. So it'll be fun. Anyway, I feel like I've got a lot of things coming up. And so I'm I'm trying to appreciate the like the seven quiet. days I have at home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then it'll really be a bit of a nightmare That's good. for a while. Seven days is a good like yeah. period, like a good long period. Yeah. Although we are recording a lot during that time. So I feel like it's uh i don't know how much relaxing i'm doing i'll just be researching recording re- so anyway i'm i'm just happy to be at home physically because i'm about to yeah. be in a lot of hotels so Wee. anyway it will it will figure itself out it always does we'll survive with that i've got you a story today christine which i honestly i feel like it's hmm I mean, it's it's a it's a good old classic story, but there's like two of the main characters are frenemies mm. and like really hate each other. Like, I don't understand what's happened. There's like to this day, they have beef, and one of them's dead. Like, they oh <laughs> what they they started as friends, and then they like very obviously broke up, and like and then just like very publicly hated each other is this like a degrassi episode i'm so confused it feels like it yeah so we'll get into it this is uh the story of the highgate vampire oh hi as in christine (laughs) uh gate as an offense and vampire (laughs) as a vampire gotcha and uh but highgate it's the name of a cemetery in london so this is uh during the british satanic panic was that a different time it was like the uh, 1970s, so I guess not. Maybe like right before yeah. our satanic panic. Um, so the British has had several panics, hysterias uh, over, the, over the course of history. But by the 20th century, that's when we got names like Aleister Crowley and Arthur mm. Edward Waite. And, um, so this era of like British occultism came after the first wave of spiritualism. Okay. And it led to a lot of accusations about local satanic cults. So, by the way, there is, like, no real evidence for these cults in a lot of spaces, but Mm. they were constantly getting blamed for any wrongdoings going on. Um, And this, I think, is so wild is that even when satanic rituals and satanic cults would be blamed for things, the police never had to go looking for evidence because they would say it was too dangerous for them because oh, come on the there was quote a very real danger of police being hypnotized that was their reasoning okay. so they're like <laughs> okay. we don't even need to find evidence to know this is wrong and if we go oh, looking for on. it it's too troublesome okay so despite having no evidence the police were still adamant that the rumors were true that satanic cults were just sweeping the nation mm-hmm. um in 1954 there was a uh, I think it was like a magazine or like a, a weekly called Witchcraft Today. Oh, um, and it I was, want that. I want it so bad. <laughs> uh, it was published by Gerald Gardner and it promoted Wicca, which even Wiccans during the Satanic Panic, they were speaking out against Satanists and black magic. Oh, wow. And they were, uh, they were like, you're giving us a bad name, probably. Yeah, and I mean, still to this day, a lot of people clump all witchcraft together. Right, right so, exactly. And I know um, my own stepmom w- taught me at a very young age, there's a difference between black magic and white magic. Sure. And a good witch and a bad witch. And so I think a lot of Wiccans would like write into witchcraft today or would be promoted in witchcraft today as as advertising for white magic or good magic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, on top of that, so this was during the, I said it was during the 70s, but it was during like the 50s to 70s. So um, I think earlier, definitely, yeah. than Satanic Panic. On top of that, cemeteries were being vandalized and graves were being dug up, and it was 
being Mm. blamed on black magic, uh, despite zero evidence. Mm. By 1964, police said that there were over 200 cases involving black magic and satanic cults. Again, even though there was very little evidence. Yeah, well, it was too dangerous, M. Uh, no one wants to get hypnotized. What do you expect? Yeah, Especially them to go get the hypnotized? Police. Are you kidding? Uh, this, however, led to people associating the British, uh, the 200 cases of cemetery vandalism in the area. This had people associating British cemeteries with satanic rituals. Mm. And that brings us to Highgate Cemetery, which is in. I hope I'm saying it right. Islington, Islington in London. Oh, um, I don't know. I would. I don't know. It wouldn't it be s- Islington, like like the British Isles. Oh, I saw most sources just said London, and then I, on one I found the name, and so and you I just s- had to be specific <laughs> and wrong apparently at the same time. So <laughs> no, I mean I I don't know. I really don't know. So. In the in the general London area, there's a sure. cemetery called Highgate. Um. Fun fact, this cemetery is where Karl Marx is buried. Oh! Um, It's also where Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh my god! Oh, I didn't know he was dead. I guess that's probably an old book. And probably the most important person to be buried there is Roland Hill, who invented the modern postal service. No. So, good for him. (laughs) Roland. (laughs) Roland. Classic. Uh, so Highgate is split into two parts, and there's a road right down uh, the middle of it called Swain's Lane. And in 1839 is when the oldest part of the cemetery was opened. And okay. uh, up until, or since 1839, over 100,000 people have been buried there. Oh, geez. Um, the cemetery got damaged and overrun over the years, but especially after World War II. And the area became notorious for kind of troublemakers if you will mm. um just because it was an overgrown cemetery um they would teenagers would damage property they would allegedly even drag bodies out of coffins ah well i mean i guess if people are digging up the graves then like the next step would be opening coffins i can't imagine you're digging up a grave to not open it to not to right open the yeah coffin, like right? what's the point yeah I mean, um, not that there's a point. Okay, you know what? Yeah, I wasn't involved. I swear to God, I was really busy that day, whatever day it was. <laughs> and uh, was there and can attest to my oh, whereabouts. This is the beginning of our friend and me breakup. I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so all these rabble rousers, troublemaking mm. teens, um, they would damage property. As I said, they were dragging out bodies. I assume to swipe the jewelry off of them or something. But a lot of people thought that it was to drag them out for sacrifice rituals or blood rituals okay Um, in the 1960s two of these teen occultists as they're being called they spent a lot of time in highgate and their names were david and sean what year was this sorry this was in the 1960s okay they were two of the kids that you know participated in roused roused some rabble yeah you know what it's all about (laughs) i gotcha it's almost as if you were there christine interesting you know what um Mm-hmm. You're literally getting high right now, so I don't trust anything you're saying about being a a good citizen. I, mean, I might as well be a fucking Satanist, I guess. Yeah. In the sixties, you would have been. They would if have done you a ask PSA our about you. Yeah, yeah, it would be bad. Uh, so anyway, two of the teenagers from the 1960s that were often in Highgate were David and Sean, and I want you to remember those names because they're the two who. Are mm. the Alpha Bun Glinda to this story, if you will. Okay, now we're talking. They don't make it, unfortunately. You know, you said good witch, bad witch, and I kept my mouth shut, but then <gasps> you just said their names, and I'm really excited. <laughs> Didn't even occur to me I used a witch reference. Oh my yeah. God, I'm so smart. Okay. You are. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Hmm. Moving on. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, who noticed it? Okay, you're right. <laughs> So they formed a, a group together, which this does feel like something we would do in the 60s if we were already hanging out in graveyards, which we've <laughs> agreed early before this episode that we would do. Oh, absolutely. They formed a group together called the British Occult Society. Which, Ooh. Like, we could create an occult society. We yeah, I love that it. Out. I think we kind of have already. That's an excellent point, actually. Um, <laughs> and that's why I drank occult society for sure. <laughs> they formed this group and they eventually got, uh, I guess it was where people could send in reports of, you know, spooky things. That's kind of the vibe I got. I don't know the official 
mission statement of the British Occult Society. I don't know if they had one. But eventually they're getting reports of entities around town, one of them being a hypnotizing dark figure at Highgate. <laughs> Don't wonder, tell the police. I was going to say, I feel like a <laughs> cop is the one who reported it. They're hypnotizing yeah. me. <laughs> um, and this is in 1969. David decides that he's going to stay at Highgate and investigate for the night. And just before midnight, he sees this figure himself. Uh-oh. He says that it's dark. It's walking by him. It's just like this kind of shadow figure. It's seven feet tall. Its eyes were inhuman. Mm. And they were, in fact, hypnotizing him. And he said he had to break eye contact to shake the, mm. the spell off. And then the figure vanished. Mm -hmm. After this experience, David wrote into the local paper and asked other readers to share their experiences at Highgate. Which, what a topical thing to do if, like, there's, like, all these stories of, you know, you know, bad kids at Highgate. You know they're seeing something at night or something. Yeah. They're trying to scare each other. There could very easily be... A wave of stories come in of this yeah, is something like, I saw there. It's like pre-Reddit. You couldn't just make a forum online. So now you got to yeah. use a newspaper. <laughs> what a, I'm kind of, I shouldn't be mind blown at that. But yeah, the newspaper is just original Reddit. Yeah, crazy. sort of. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so he asked other people to share their experiences from Highgate. And a bunch of people wrote in and they said that they had also seen the exact same figure he was talking about. Another person wrote in saying that they saw a tall man in a hat who apparently would just disappear. He would walk into the walls of the cemetery. Uh, and people just kind of wrote in what they had seen. Soon enough, people were writing in, though, that there was a particular entity there called the Highgate Ghost. Mm. And he made front page news eventually after so many people had written in. So The ghost did? The ghost. There was, <gasps> it was called Spooked. And Ooh. it was, or Spooks. And it was the headline of the front page front page news Whoa. all about the Highgate ghost. Locals had multiple different names for it called the White Ghost, Mad Arthur, and the Wild Eggman. I like that one the best. I like that one too. It sounds like a Pokemon or something. <laughs> it does. So some people wrote in that there were other ghosts as well in Highgate. Um, so one was said to chase women, which is terrifying and Great. maybe not a ghost. Yeah, right? Another is, say it with me, a lady in white. Mm, always. And she would try to lure people into the water nearby. Oh. And when she would get into the water, the water would not move. And soon she would disappear into the water herself. Ooh. Uh, the main character, though, was this ghost of a man in a hat. And okay. David and Sean looked into this entity, and I don't know their research protocol, <laughs> but ultimately, they determined that this was not a ghost. This was a vampire. Oh, my mistake. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm like, mm. well, how did that happen? Sorry. Uh, one of their main sources that they worked off of was the fact that several animals in the area, like foxes and all that, were being found dead around town with <gasps> neck wounds. Oh, and it no. looked like the neck wounds were causing them to be completely drained of their blood. <gasps> Uh-oh. In February... Of 1970, uh, the local paper, you know that the reporters are going crazy for this with all these yeah. articles coming in. The local paper wrote an article called, Does a Vampire Walk in Highgate? <laughs> and in the article, Sean said, this is not just a vampire, my friends. This is a king vampire from Romania. What? <laughs> I think Sean... Is Had a, a flair for the dramatic. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds a little off his rocker to me in that way, but okay. I don't know. Whatever, I can't say yes say. or no, I guess. True. Uh, he said it's a king vampire from Romania, which a king vampire sounds like a type of spider or something. Like It does. Like, oh, a king vampire. Don't um, let it bite ya. Uh, it, sa it sounds to me that this really was like the king of vampires or something. Or like maybe, maybe it's... Like, like a powerful that, vampire yeah like the concept of like it's a oh my god i was gonna say rat king but i feel like maybe that's not a good analogy <laughs> i don't the, know in the world of vampire hierarchies yeah like I he's like, like called a vampire archy but vampire archy whatever that's a good one um you know i am the smartest one of the two of us that is true that is true i, I say it all that. the time <laughs> so this king vampire however he may be or came to be known <laughs> 
he apparently has a bunch of supporters and uh, <laughs> these these fans of him. They helped him move to England in the 1700s. That's well, that was the, nice. That's the story we're going with. They like carried his couch up the stairs and everything. Yeah. He's a good friend, you know? I'm wondering, like, <laughs> did he go to bed in a coffin and not wake up? And so they all carried his coffin to England? <laughs> well, we're his friends. We should really. Uh... Couldn't they wait till it was like nighttime and he could wake up and the sun wouldn't be there and he would just fly to England? Like, why did they have to bring him there? I'm telling you, maybe he had a heavy futon. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully, I know exactly where he put that futon, by the way, because the theory then goes that once he got to England, he moved to the London's West End. Oh, okay. Um, good for him. Yeah. I wonder what his Zillow looked like before he oh, got there. Oh, I wish I could know. Sean believed that these grave desecrations and the vandalism going on in the cemetery were rituals by his supporters to bring the king vampire back. Which, like, I thought you brought him here. Yeah, come on, make up your mind. Bring him back? Was he dead? How did he maybe, die? Maybe it's... Maybe the they meant bring vampire? him back... Maybe they meant bring him back to Romania. But they Wait. brought him to England. I know. Hmm. It, Sean, <laughs> I need clarity here. Maybe... Okay, hear me out. Maybe the vampire's friends are not vampires or his supporters, and so they don't live forever, so they keep dying out, and the new ones have to step in, and so they're like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, maybe, like... Like like a new um like a new e board got together and they were yeah. like we actually They're don't like, like we're what making the last some changes did. yeah mm -hmm. exactly uh, that makes sense right guys <laughs> so in this king vampires fraternity they all got together yeah. for a chapter meeting and agreed that they were gonna make some some go back to Romania changes. yeah 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 as I was looking through these notes I gotta tell you it did not make much sense so I'm just <laughs> reporting the news here. I like I'm following perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, apparently everything that had been going on in the cemeteries in the last few years was clearly the King Vampire's supporters, and they were trying to bring him back with these rituals that they were performing in this overgrown mm. cemetery. Sean said that now that he knows, apparently with confidence, that the King Vampire is here and the rituals must have worked for so much tomfoolery to have happened in the cemetery. Right. Which, like, I feel like if he were back, they would Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> Sean said now that he's officially back with uh, no public statement or anything, he just said, well, now we have to get rid of the king vampire. And the only way to do that is to, quote, exercise the vampire in the traditional and approved manner. Is do that a uh, stake through the heart? So that's what I... Uh, yes, yes. But apparently there's more to it, which I did not know. Mm. I always thought stake through the heart, bada bing, bada boom, one, two, three. Yeah. Apparently I was wrong. This is okay. the traditional manner. Drive, this is a quote of his. Drive a stake through his heart with one blow just after dawn between Friday and Saturday. Chop his head off with a grave digger's shovel and oh. burn what remains. Okay, my guess was separate the body parts and burn them. For some reason, that was my next guess. So I was sort of it's onto something. Because as we figured out earlier, you were there. You were definitely oh, right. there. <laughs> <laughs> but also... You're like, I have this weird vision. It's so of the, weird. <laughs> I have the most accurate answer. It's for so weird. I'm holding this shovel and oh my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm holding this vampire's head and I, I don't know where oh, he came no. from. <laughs> It's the weirdest thing. So according to Sean, quote, <laughs> this is what the clergy did centuries ago, but today we'd be breaking the law. So we can't Aww. just go chopping around heads and stabbing people on the heart anymore. Oh, man. So, of course, this was Sean's opinion that mm. this is what we should do. But other people's opinions, including an actual minister who I don't know his life story, but he was an actual minister and then became a vampire exorcist at one point. Sure. Didn't, didn't know that was a real thing. <laughs> but um, even people like him were saying, um, this is not a vampire case. I don't know what Sean's talking about. <gasps> like, so. And Sean, Sean is literally referencing the clergy in his <laughs> argument. So it's like now the clergy is like, I don't think so, which is not a good sign for you. Exactly. He's like, this is what they did. And they're yeah. like, mm, but OK. Mm. But as someone who's exercised actual vampires, yeah. which yeah. I'd like to know his experience. That's got to be another that. episode. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who claims to have actually exercised vampires, he's saying this is not a vampire case. Okay. Another skeptic wrote this. Uh, 
I don't know if it's really scathing, but it's certainly passive aggressive. Okay, he's, even he better. Said this, <laughs> he said this about Sean. He said, the British occult society is to be congratulated on fighting a brave last ditch battle. But alas, it's too late by at least three generations. <gasps> oh, I like man. that he inserted brave. Into yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Nothing oh. more condescending. It's so condescending. Yes, Sean, <laughs> you've been so brave. Now step aside. <laughs> you've been such a brave young lad. Did I call you brave for something for a show? Yeah, it was very rude. I don't remember though. Did I say? Oh, I was like, it's so brave that you'll just wear that. <laughs> and yeah, we were literally in the car on the way to the show, and I was like, it's so brave of you to wear wh- like whatever to a show. <laughs> like, He's such an ass. <laughs> It was probably the funniest thing I said all night, I think. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, so you're going to wear that? No. <laughs> that is so brave of you. As I walk out in like sweatpants and a hoodie. <laughs> like we're... F- <laughs> okay. So despite the many skeptics against Sean being like, this isn't a mm. vampire. I wonder if they were skeptics who believed in vampires. Right. But were or, like, this isn't one. Or if they were just like, this is, vampires, this is all baloney. Yeah. Like your best guess is a vampire and you're saying it with your whole chest. Okay. <laughs> so despite the many skeptics, uh, many do agree with Sean. So there's a real back and forth okay. here. I'm like team Sean and vampires team. This isn't a vampire. And David, who at the time seems to be very pro Sean. Yeah. He even says, I am prepared to pursue it taking whatever means necessary so we can all rest. <gasps> oh. and, and this is the first sign of things getting a little messy because David later recants this and says he was kidding to the interviewer. Well, that's it is a hilarious joke if he was kidding. F- the funnier than my brave comment for Barely, sure. Barely, but, but a little bit funnier, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, at the time, he allegedly was very, you know, this is a vampire and we're yeah. going to put this thing to rest. So Sean and David, they get interviewed on TV about this. This is how involved the town is about this stuff. And of course, it's on a Friday the 13th. Mm. And apparently right before they went on, the cameraman clutched his throat and passed out. Oh, clutched his own throat. I thought you might clutch Sean's throat. I was like, (laughs) true crime. Here we come. Okay. No, clutched Clutched his own (gasps) throat as if like a vampire bit him and he passed out. And he's carrying that heavy camera. You know that probably shattered everywhere. Oh, and it was from the 70s. How so expensive. expensive. Oh. So then they had to get a second cameraman. So eventually, I guess he was fine, but everyone was a little rattled at that. Like, what are the odds? Mm-hmm. And he uh, and David said that was kind of odd that we were going to get interviewed. And then this guy like just fell over. But on top of that, before this interview, we were getting a bunch of death threats for satanic cult- from satanic cults for exposing their work. Whoa. Um, one of the letters he got was written in blood oh with a bunch of symbols all over it and it said by your interference with the work of our high order you have invoked the wrath of lord had it had it had it had it by his element and the power of the sevenfold cross you shall now be destroyed this is decreed by his grace, and this wish will be fulfilled through our order. Be it thus so. <laughs> Written in blood. I was going to say, that's a lot of words to write out in blood. It's really, I appreciate the floweriness, but like for a satanic cult, I feel like you could have just kind of been boom to the point. You could have just put a symbol and everyone would have been like, ah! you know like that's so much blood to write out it is you couldn't just like try to keep it concise so concise anyway i don't know so during this interview uh after so they've gotten these threats they get to their spot it's on friday the 13th this guy passes out as if someone bit him now they're doing the interview Mm -hmm. and during this interview sean says oh well david actually plans to stay the night and hike and slay the vampire (laughs) Oh, my God. That's something like you and I would literally joke about for sure. Joke about. But also, like, if one of us did that to the other, like, talk about like a friendship ender or like at least uh, on live television. Like that is. That's not cool. Well, because also, like, think of the um, I don't don't remember what I don't know what the right word I'm trying to think of is. But think of the hysteria that's already through the town. And now you're like label like your geo 
you're locating <gasps> exactly where he's going to be all Good night. Good point. And what he plans on doing. And people have been sending him death threats. Like, <sighs> oh, not good. What an asshole. Anyway, Christine's address is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like she plans to spend the night there and look for the devil. Um, oh so, my god! And so, and not only that, but on top of it, he says, "Well, David plans on spending the night here, but now he's not going to be doing that anymore because quote we feel he does not possess sufficient knowledge to exercise <gasps> successfully something as powerful as powerful or as evil." Wait, and, so he's just like double blow. Like, like so also he's stupid and he's not strong yeah, enough to fight. So like this I'm thing. gonna throw you under the bus and then I'm gonna drive the bus backwards over you again because <laughs> the first time wasn't enough. But I'm gonna say you're staying the night here, surprise, on live TV, no pressure. But also you're too stupid to do it, so yeah. never mind. Like what? All of it is so yeah, years later, David even said in another interview by himself, he was like, I never planned to stay the night, but <gasps> Sean just said that. Like we what never a even dick. <laughs> like, can you imagine not even ever having discussed that? And now Sean is like saying this and, and like, you're on live, TV. You're supposed to save face. Oh god. Yeah, so like what is I wonder what he did of like, uh Sure. I didn't plan on that, but okay. Oh my god. So I guess he was like, well, at least you like got me out of that by saying I'm too stupid to stay. Yeah, thanks so. for pulling the plug on that. So years later, David said he actually never planned to be there. But he also said that Sean had like um, had reached out to a lot of people for publicity to make this interview really successful. Um, and so that might have been why he did it for like the publicity stunt of mm. it all or it could have just been to make david look bad because i was in gonna say but also like can you just say oh i plan to spend the night like why do you have to say he's planning you know what i mean yeah, like why didn't yeah. you just if you're gonna do a publicity stunt why don't you just say and i plan to bravely spend the night you know what i mean like why are you throwing this guy under the bus well so here's a weird thing this is where the friendship gets messier or where like our understanding of it gets messier is that David says, I never planned to be there, but at the same time, he did stay there for several more hours after the interview. So I don't know if oh, Sean so he, was... David did. So Dave, yeah, David did oh. stay, even though he claims we never discussed that. And then Sean even said, oh, David plans on being here, but now he's not going to be there. And was he there alone after the interview? He was there alone. Oh, weird. It makes so no sense. So maybe he's like, I'm not stupid. Maybe this was all, uh, <laughs> oh. what do you call it? uh psychology reverse psychology he's yeah. like he's too dumb to do it right and yeah, then try to prove himself yeah <laughs> but yeah so i don't understand how that worked out or what the Weird. real story is but it sounds like he ended up sticking around anyway mm. and people must have thought like maybe he'll still be there or maybe we can get a glimpse of them doing this interview live it ended up turning out that within hours of this interview a mob was at the <gasps> cemetery oh no um and this was you know at the time, people heard he might be slaying a vampire tonight. Oh, so sure. They were like, we got to get over there. And it basically looked like pitchforks and torches and like <gasps> what you would imagine. And it was as big as like a crowd of people at a football game. The police could not control the crowd. Oh, over 100 shit. people broke into the cemetery with their own weapons to help <gasps> fight the vampire. And at the end of the night, somehow the crowd kind of dissipated on its own nobody ended up being harmed shocking damn well yeah that is shocking especially if everyone's bringing weapons yeah but it ended up causing a bit of a scene so sure everything kind of started to die down until august um and that the that was march so okay a f like about five months later Three girls are walking around the cemetery, you know, and they're probably seeing like, it's probably Yumi and Eva or yeah. something going like, wow, I can't believe a vampire was almost slain here. This is so spooky. <laughs> well, so they're in the cemetery by themselves and they find the remains of a body and <gasps> it was, she was removed from her coffin. Oh. She was charred <gasps> and decapitated. Oh, no. And police, of course, said, I don't know, but this could be black magic. Well, we can't check. We can't. We couldn't check if we wanted to. Close your eyes. And the British Occult Society, David and Sean's group, they uh, still believed that this could be the doing of a vampire because they never slayed the vampire and therefore he's still uh -huh. out there. Later on, David claims that he and Sean, fun fact, could never actually agree on what type of vampire this thing was. 
So Sean okay. was very king vampire who came over from Romania and lives in the West End with apparently. his fut- heavy futon, right? And his fraternity of brothers, yeah. Yeah. Um David, however, thought this was more of a demonic vampire like entity. Ooh. Which I like that. I, I like kinda that. like that better, no offense, Sean. I also wonder if it's because I believe in demons more than I believe in more vampires. More than a vampire. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Um so Which is kind of a wild thing to say, but it's true. I know. So <laughs> I know, yeah. It's I don't know how I feel about it. I don't either. Uh, so that same month after this this body was found, like a week later, uh, David ends up getting arrested in Highgate because he's trying to summon and thus banish the demon he thinks this vampire is. Oh my goodness! And I wonder if it's because he heard about that body and he was like, "This thing is still large. I need to do something about <sighs> it." Um, but due to so he goes in to like summon this thing and then he's going to try to banish it, basically do an exorcism. And due to minimal to no evidence of David doing anything truly illegal, because it was never right. like totally written into the law, he's like kind of ev- evaded it and he ended up being exonerated. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a hard thing to pin down, like, yeah, what the actual charge is when you're arrested for that. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could get trespassing, right? But- yeah, that's probably true. Um, a year later, David and others tried to summon this thing again. So I guess he thought, well, I'll get exonerated again. Um, He's like, it's called double jeopardy, right? Isn't that how this works? <laughs> Not really, but maybe a little bit. So he tried to summon this thing again with a group of people, but uh, he refused to share what they did. He said, quote, the intrinsic details regarding this part of the ritual may not be disclosed as this would violate magical secrecy. <laughs> It's like, Sorry, what a, I don't mean to laugh, but what a okay. flowery, vague way to say, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, yeah, I plead the fifth because it's, it's magic or something. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they did, apparently their circle that they formed went icy cold. <laughs> apparently the candles went out. Uh, the fire that they had going blew away and there was a dark presence nearby. Uh oh. Um, they tried to banish it and it didn't totally work, which as someone who is a ghost believer i would be terrified that thing would follow me home hell yeah um they wanted to go back and try to banish it again but they never got the chance and uh david basically said i still think satanists and cults and rituals are um being done in highgate and that's the best i've got (sighs) unfortunately the public turned against david when uh because it used to be david and sean and then they went against David and they stayed with Team Sean. Mm. When Sean started telling people, I don't know what like, you know, behind closed doors fight they had. Yeah. But this is clearly where they had a breakup or they were about to. Because Sean started telling everybody publicly, David practices black magic. This guy is fucking toxic. What okay. A, what a crazy, what crazy a fucking thing to menace. Do. He is like He is so toxic. Like, he's that person in the reality show where you're like, okay, you're just trying to create a narrative around yourself. He's a shit stirrer. He's a shit stirrer. You're a fucking villain, you know? It sounds so far, and I don't know who's right and I don't know who's wrong, but I will say in terms of, like, initial behavior, I don't know about David starting this problem, you know? Yeah, it seems like all all, uh, roads lead back to a certain someone named Sean. All I know is all of David's opinions came way after the fact, and he is now telling his side. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't sound, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But something must have happened between the two of them. And then Sean was like, I'm going to ruin you. And then told everybody, Ooh. I practice black magic. You've already been arrested for hijinks in the cemetery. People already think that you're trying to banish demons. Like You've been arrested. Oh, you said that already. Yeah, <laughs> arrested. Like. Ugh bad news oh he's really just stepping on him while he's down and so i guess sean was trying to imply that david is evil and does black magic meanwhile i am good and do white magic that was that's kind of what he's implying because in 1973 they really go toe to toe when sean publicly challenges david to a magic duel Okay. (laughs) Um, Okay. (laughs) What the fuck? 
1973, he challenges David to a magic duel. The duel was set again for a Friday the 13th, <laughs> and publicity for it quickly spread, if you can't imagine it. Yeah, I imagine. Posters advertising the duel quickly referenced to things like blood sacrifices and naked virgins appearing at oh, this place. Oh, come on. Um, they couldn't, it wasn't enough, apparently, that this was a magic duel. They had to make Seriously. it even more so. And these ads also made David come off as the evil one. And uh, honestly, he, he was scared of what the crowd would do to him. So he bailed. He ended up- Honestly the, smart, I think. The duel didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and also, I don't know, I don't know the true inner workings of who's right and who's wrong here, but if I'm, I'm currently slightly leaning towards David right now. Yeah, you're I'd being be... very diplomatic. You're being more diplomatic than me, <laughs> which usually is not how it works. But I'm like, <laughs> fuck this Sean guy. But like, David, like, he's, can you imagine just getting in a fight with your friend and all of a sudden people think you're an evil warlock and yeah. like, <laughs> yes. and Jesus <laughs> Christ, you can't get a break. And when you, and people... When people weren't invited to the cemetery, a mob came that couldn't be controlled by the police. Imagine yeah. now people coming to see a magic duel. We're like, what if you don't even practice magic? Like now that's just What if you're what if you're like unhinged and you're like really team Sean or Team David and you're gonna like act on it and like yeah. attack? I mean, I don't know. This yeah, it's feeling like it's not safe. It's not feeling safe. Mm -mm. And ultimately all of this, because you know, he bailed on the magic tool and Sh sean already had this whole thing set up he already had people coming and so he didn't know what to do he ended up turning it into a public exorcism on david's evil powers okay so now david's just like on a couch he's into couch somewhere and he's just <laughs> oh sitting no there. i hope he is i hope he's at least having some <laughs> marijuana to, to ease his nerves because he deserves it <laughs> and he's just sitting there and to know a whole <sighs> section of town is like now doing a public exorcism on your behalf honestly i almost hope he doesn't believe any of this because otherwise that would be so scary if you're laying there and you're like they're doing something to my, to me and i have no control or say if i were david i would literally leave town i'd be I, like i would be gone for sure yeah that's like, scary i'm starting over this is bullshit um <sighs> Ultimately, this all just basically led to town gossip and more like infighting between people who are in the occult. There was one guy named uh, Long John Baldry. Long John Baldry. Okay. And he said that David was to blame for his missing cat. His cat went ran off oh, and he assumed that David was using it for a ritual. So this feels like a very individualized witch hunt, like a literal witch yes, hunt against you're David. You're 100% right. Um. It's like, so oh, my crops are dead. It must be David's fault. My cat's missing. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. And even though the cat eventually came home, that wasn't enough. Are you serious? And another couple in town accused <sighs> David of animal cruelty for other animals he just, they must not have caught. That's and insane. Pissed off about this. I think this is where David's starting to snap. Yeah. Uh, this is where uh, Elphaba all of a sudden becomes the <laughs> Wicked Witch, if you will. <laughs> she turns green. It's a whole thing. She, so David sends Long John Baldry um, two mini coffins, which I guess are like a death curse or an omen oh or something. Oh, my God. And he sends the couple who accuses him of animal cruelty and like ask for him to be arrested, like press charges on him. <gasps> uh, David sends them a box of dolls with pins stuck in their heads and a note with a threatening spell on it. Uh oh, David, you're David. making yourself not look good. I know what you're doing. I know you're stressed, but this isn't the answer, my friend. <laughs> We're spiraling, David. This We're is... getting a little <laughs> off course. <laughs> this is make this. You're you're giving them what they want, my friend. Yeah, so you're right. You're giving them ammo. Uh, so David did later say none of these were actual curses. They were being dramatic. I was just kind of retaliating with the accusations they've thrown at me. Yeah, which I get. I get, but also, like, David, you have to be the classier one. It wasn't you know? smart. Yeah, it really it was, wasn't. No. It was not classy. Uh, the next, so he says, like, oh, like, I, they weren't real curses. No, I'm not going to curse anybody, not after everything that's already been thrown at me. But he did, like, put, like, a death omen of sorts on Long John Baldry's front door step. And a year later, Long John Baldry got hit by a fucking train and died. Oh, my God. And guess he got hit by a train? And guess who everyone blamed? <gasps> Sean. No, I wish. 
<laughs> honestly, at this point. So a year, uh, oh, yeah, a year later, he ended up dying, and everyone oh, blamed David. And a neighbor, that's crazy. A neighbor near the Highgate Cemetery later found a headless corpse on his property. And that was like the final straw for the police. They were like, okay, we have to blame somebody. And so, (sighs) well, no comment. But so they decided that they were going to blame the British Occult Society for all of the issues in the cemetery. Oh, my God. Um, Just because Sean and David were like, their names kept popping up. I was going to say, I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire. Like these two have been kind of rousing rabble in the cemetery for years now. (laughs) And... uh. I guess it could have been fair. There was no solid evidence that they were ever the ones who dug up graves. They were never the ones who vandalized the cemetery. They just kept, it just kept being like the location of all their discussions. Uh, I see. um, Or they kept talking about the Highgate vampire, which was in the Highgate cemetery. And so they just kind of got associated with each other, but it wasn't fair to um, blame the British occult society, especially since they hadn't, done any of these things and the cemetery was already having these issues for decades before right okay that's true so it really wasn't fair to just point at those two but they arrested david anyway not sean just david and uh (sighs) they were able to use photos of his rituals as evidence to be like well he's doing rituals he probably in the cemetery Uh and by the way the (sighs) rituals like and the photos taken of these rituals the irony is incredible because David was taking photos of his rituals as evidence that they were not anyone who does rituals would be able to tell, Oh, these aren't evil rituals. These aren't satanic cult <gasps> magic still rituals worked against him. Oh no. But like, you know, ignorant people not in the occult world saw rituals and they were right. oh, see, he's there's evil. no good rituals for those people. Right. And he'd already been like dragged through the mud and like Shit. in all of the town that he was evil. And I mean, hello, I'm sure exhibit A was those posters about a magic duel for against an evil yeah. witch. So it just all looked really bad. And then there were pictures of him doing rituals at and all. And then that guy dying after he left him a death threat or whatever. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And one of the photos of his rituals, I guess his girlfriend happened to be there one night and the girlfriend was nude. I don't know if that is involved in the ritual or if it was just like, I'm with my girlfriend and we got naked in the woods and Mm -hmm. it just happened to be like in the pile of pictures. It happens to the best of us. Um, Oh, it was in the photos. Oh, no. But so it was in the photos. It was like essentially in the album, uh, if you will, of his other ritual photos and so then people started saying oh well this is obviously necromancy because which like she's alive yeah by the way Mm, yeah the the judge assumed again ignorantly this must mean necromancy because there's a naked woman during a magic ritual okay sure so basically not looking good for david because if you're going to leave it in if you're going to leave that decision of your time in prison to the hands of people who don't know anything about this stuff yeah yeah it's not gonna look good oh so, no this guy can't catch a break so he ends up uh basically he was given four years in prison <gasps> and wow that blows two years into his sentence eventually some teenagers came forward and they said the recent damages and grave digging were our fault and wow. I, don't, I don't know what like caused them to all of a sudden have like this moral compass of like, like guilt guilt complex i don't know maybe or maybe one of them broke and then the rest had to Uh, follow i don't know something happened but they even when they were asked why are you doing this why are you digging up people's bodies and like cutting their heads off and shit it's a fair question they said for the laugh of it (sighs) that's what i'm saying like what moral compass anyway literally one of them stole a corpse's head and kept it as a trophy oh my god little serial killers in the making it seems uh so i i guess they really must have had a full 180 change of heart Mm -hmm. and they went david didn't do anything and so he ended up getting parole um and that was two years after already being in jail and to be fair even those who were against david going to jail or being charged with all this they were when they were already against him as a person and thought he was evil they thought his charges were unfair um even Sean publicly defended him. and Oh, they, well, Sean was... wants to step forward all of a sudden. Okay. <laughs> Sean was saying, like, 
decades of vandalism in the cemetery is not David's fault, and there's no evidence that he even ever vandalized the cemetery. Great point. All of that kind of added up, and two years into his sentence, he was released on parole, and he ended up winning a bunch of libel lawsuits against the media. Oh, good. Which, like, I mean, talk about deserving it, right? Like, yeah. Like, winning those arguments. Um. After all of this, David did still believe that satanic cults were the true cause of Highgate's desecrations, and David continued to run the British Occult Society until his death in 2019. Wow. Um, and David and Sean seemed to never stop having beef with each other. Aww. Um, Which, like, I was really rooting for those two, but how do you come back from so much I of know. that? I know. I feel like Sean, really, no offense, but it's, it's Sean's fault. <laughs> So we have mentioned we have a lovely researcher and, you know, they helped us with these notes. But um, I want to say this was the the note I got with my research from okay. them. They said, uh, oh, here are notes on the Highgate vampire. This is what I found. And then said, I found a Facebook group where people are still arguing about it as recently as last week. One of the men involved, Sean, has been caught making fake accounts to argue with people. <gasps> so that little sneaky sneak so apparently the feud is still on even though you david died have. four years ago you know what david i'm gonna take up the mantle and i'm gonna defend you no i'm not i don't have the time for that we have enough <laughs> facebook we have enough social media shit to deal with on our own but wow that is banana grams yeah so apparently people up until a week ago are still arguing this and i don't know if it's arguing like was sean right or david right but they could even be arguing like was it a vampire was it a right. ghost what what's going on was could it a king nothing? vampire was it, <laughs> was it a king <laughs> and uh anyway other than that there is a fundraising group called the friends of highgate and they have raised enough funds for the cemetery to fix up certain sections of highgate and they've actually well, been able good. to keep bodies from being desecrated again that's good too you can still buy tickets to visit the cemetery you can go on a tour of the cemetery if you'd like and i'll just end on this fun fact that the highgate vampire also appears in season nine of buffy oh Uh, and the vampire is revealed to not be a vampire but a demon that feeds off of its victims emotional trauma okay spoiler alert first of all but okay (laughs) Just saying, she'd be nice and well fed if she were to attack me. If she's yeah, feeding off of I was of gonna say, be careful because I think we're both targets. <laughs> oh. Anyway, that is the Highgate, the Highgate vampire slash the drama between two very uh, um, unfortunate souls. I can see why this struck a chord with you. Very frenemy centric. The second, the second I saw our researcher say they're still fighting about it as of a week ago, I you were like, like, "I'm not well, even going to not even gonna... all aboard." Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um good job what a story thank you oh okay anyway well, tell me tell me something awful please happily okay i have a story for you this is the story of ellen sherman ellen sherman okay mm-hmm. I so i know who that is <clears throat> you're about to ellen okay. and ed sherman happy couple lived together in niantic connecticut for the entirety of their 16-year marriage. Niantic is a village in the town of East Lyme, Connecticut, um, and it is an affluent New England seaside town. So there, it's, it's, it's like a kind of a hoity-toity Connecticut community, mm. like hi, high class, high brow. A country club type of town. Country club type of town. It's kind of what you picture when you hear like Connecticut, you know. <sighs> I, I asked Blaze what, what, how to pronounce that town. He's like, I've never heard of it. So that, that tells you, that maybe tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> Not to sound so country clubby, but like, man, Connecticut is quite a town. It's oh. a, very, a very fun place to summer, if you will. A summer? Well, they have like Cape Cod and all that over there. So, you know, well, yeah. They're, such they're a s- sucker for a little beach town. You such are. A I know. I know you are. Well, you'd probably be friends with this guy. I don't I hope know. Not. I, I hope not. But. would probably not be. I would maybe be the person running the coffee shop that he you know visits that's true i I would not be allowed in the same circle as you'd be making his london fox yeah (laughs) so in the 80s there were fewer than three thousand people living in this village um and it's one of those like 
classic bubbles where people just feel safe and they leave their doors unlocked, which is the same as a story I covered last week. Uh, People just don't lock their doors. And the Shermans were especially lax about this. So they would leave their house unlocked even when they went out, like even when they weren't home. And one friend, he uh, used to joke with Ellen saying, you're going to come home some night and have nothing left in your house. Like you guys are just so loosey goosey. And one day someone's going to walk in and just take all you have. Right. Um, I bet but, he felt real bad about that oh, later on in life. It's not a good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually in a Forensic Files episode like mentions that he's like yeah i used to tell her this all the time about i mean your door like this is not the time to say you were right but like uh, that's it's got to be really rough just lock like, your doors folks just you never know doors. people I, are unwell and they'll there's dangerous people out there i feel like the, uh, locking your doors or the doors always being unlocked is this season or this era's version of pillar to killer of like great guy in the community like I feel yeah, like... just so safe in this town where they never lock the doors. And then last week it was like a serial killer showed up, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm just like, don't mess with it. Just lock the door, you know. You never know. Um, so either way, Ellen didn't seem worried about it. Uh, she was a very laid back person, very friendly. Um, she was not only loved by the community, she was actually also a savvy businesswoman. Very successful. Uh, she ha- she worked full time running the graphic design and advertising business that she and Ed owned together. But it was her family's business. So it was more her project. And she was the one who put more work into it and took home most of the money for the family. Ed, meanwhile, taught at a local community college. Uh, but like I said, the family business was like the major source of income. They had a 13-year-old daughter um, from the outside, as is, you know, normal in a lot of these places. It looked like they had this idyllic, traditional American life. Uh, People said their home was full of laughter and love. But of course, like any married couple, they did have their issues. Um, And so this is where we get into like a, a piece of their relationship that became kind of a crux of this whole story. So early on in their marriage, Ed told Ellen he wanted to open their relationship to other partners. Okay. And he said he was not a fan of traditional monogamy, which, to be fair, kind of wish he had mentioned to her before they got married. But I feel like if that's going to be a red flag for you, it maybe should have been addressed earlier. Yeah. But... And maybe you didn't find out you don't like monogamy until you participated in it, I guess. That's yeah, possible. Maybe things were getting kind of, you know, dull and you needed wanted to spice it up or something. Wanted to I don't spice know. it up. Yeah. So he uh, proposed this idea and Ellen was not a fan. But... And this is the biggest red flag one, at least you and I have discussed this with people, you know, we know who've, you know, tried out open relationships and some are really successful, some are not. And like one pattern uh, that seems to be a huge red flag is if one person feels like they're compromising to make the other person happy, Mm -hmm. like both partners should be 100 percent on board. Otherwise, I feel like things are bound to tip and, you know, go Mm -hmm. awry. So she was not a fan of this open marriage idea, but like I said, she compromised to satisfy her partner. Uh, And Ed, you know, wanted Ellen to have her own partners and she had a couple flings. She had partnerships with three different men, um, including a close friend named Len Fredrickson, who was actually the guy who said, oh, you got to lock your door and all this. So just interesting full circle. I was watching the forensic files and I was like, Oh, that guy. (laughs) So She had sex with that guy. I'm like, (laughs) I I, I know way too much. I know you, I know you. And (laughs) And it's funny because in the forensic files episode, they didn't say that. Like he wasn't like, I was one of the people, one of her partners. It's just like friend of the family, but I'm like, oh, he's one of the three that she hooked up with. That's so funky. Yeah, but it is public knowledge. I'm not like, you know, putting anyone on blast here, I don't think. But anyway, so she had flings uh, with three men, including this guy, Len, um, but they didn't stick. And Ellen just was not happy with this arrangement. Um, They tried different things. So over the years, you know, Ed regularly had uh, who he called mistresses on the side. um, And the Shermans would host swinger parties and what they called wife swap parties in their home. And, you know, whereas some of their friends knew about it and were even sometimes set up with different partners at these parties, other friends had no idea, which must be just so jarring after everything comes out and you're like, Wait, why wasn't I invited? That's what my mm-hmm. first thought would be. Why wasn't I invited to the swinger parties? <laughs> Your FOMO is like on a level it's I've never understood. Out, it's out of control 
it's sometimes. okay sometimes it's, sometimes i don't want to do like it's some i mean i guess it's on the same level kind of of like hey maybe you are, are uh, you know people even say like i know you're out of town or you won't be here but know you're invited maybe it's like i know you don't want to open up your relationship but know you're invited <laughs> yeah 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 okay but here's the thing i don't even think it's that i would want to go to the parties it's more why like wow i really didn't know this about my good friends i think that's mm. what would wig me out is like did they not feel comfortable to tell me you know what i mean like if they're having if they're like in an open marriage and um a lot of their friends know i'm like what about the ones who don't know? Are those like the conservative friends that you don't want to tell? Right. You don't want you don't want to be clumped into like yeah. maybe the, ju- the judges. I think I would just be worried like, oh, no, they didn't trust me with that information. Like, I don't want to go to the swinger party, to be clear. Um, I also don't really want to go to a country club family party to begin with. Um, so, you know, it's not FOMO about that. It's I more don't know f- if I want to go. But I do want to hear about it afterwards. I want sure. the open <laughs> bar. Hmm. I, I definitely want to like hear like how it all went. Like I want to know like the details of yeah. like, is there any good gossip? Anything cool come up? Anything, you know? And I'm like, man, they had What'd great wine. And you're like, that's not what I need to know. Christine. No, I just I just want to like hear that everyone had a good time. You know, that's that's all I'm. Yeah, I care more I, about the information than actually being involved. Yeah, I don't want to be involved at all. Actually, I just don't want to feel like, oh, they didn't trust me with their friend. You know, they didn't trust me with this information, which, again, this is not about me. And um, also. Whatever, it's not in my business, but um, it is interesting just to think about that. Some of their friends like had no idea until all of this came out like splashed across sense. the media. Like, I think that's pretty fascinating. Um, and my guess really is that they were just probably the more conservative friends that were like, nah, we're not going to bring them in, into this, you know, mm-hmm. lifestyle. So, okay. Anyway, the people who did not know about their open marriage uh, basically assumed they had a very traditional life, which goes to show how much you really know about your friends and, fa- you know, neighbors yeah. and stuff. Unless um, you go to the after swingers event brunch the next day and get the 411. And then like M has hosted it at their apartment. <laughs> <laughs> we all get to go find out what happened. Uh, yeah, I want to go to that. It I'll go to that. Fun. Yeah. It would be nothing but supportive and loving. I and I still want to be involved in my friend's world. I just that's not my vibe. That's all. No, no. Um, no, no. I just want the open bar again. But I'm <laughs> sure we'll have that at your brunch as we'll well. We'll have mimosas ready. Don't Thank worry. you. Yeah. Anyway, so eventually Ed was with a woman named Nancy Prescott as one of his what again, what he called mistresses, but he actually fell in love with her. Mm. And so here's another problem that I've sensed arises when this happens and people you know develop feelings and he starts dating her more seriously and by the way um ellen is okay with this you know she's like all right i know you're seeing this person you can date her um and so just a quick side note at this point like i said ellen and ed have one daughter at this point and ellen really wanted another baby and okay. Ed said, no, I don't want another kid. And she's like, OK, so they're kind of at an impasse. Hmm. Well, Nancy gets pregnant. The girlfriend. Ooh, that ha- cannot feel good for can't her. Can't feel good. Can't feel good for her. And it is Ed's baby. And Ellen says, you know what? If you and Nancy are having a baby, I would like a baby as well. So Ed says, fine. And he kind of relents. And Ellen gets pregnant. <laughs> Good thing to relent on. Wow. Yeah, I know. Now he's like, now I have three kids. I know. So now Ellen and Nancy are having kids, both by him. They're both aware of each other. Um, but it got to a point where he was so split among these two families, like so divided, um, that Ellen was like, you know what? I take it back. I can't live like this. Either you pick her or pick me. So Oof. yeah, now with like, kids involved though. Wow. Now with kid, multiple kids. I mean, it's messy. Talk about mm. messy. Wow, we both really picked the drama Ooh, we today. Did. <laughs> we really said we need to we need to stir shit up. Where's my mimosa? <laughs> I feel like Sean today, just fucking oh. stirring the pot. You know. Um. So in any case, he is getting like stressed out between these two families. Um. You know, she gives him this ultimatum. This is in the summer of 1985. She's several months pregnant and she says to him if you want to continue our marriage you need to break things off with nancy leave behind this like quote-unquote swinger lifestyle and we need to focus on our marriage so ed was obviously not thrilled about this um you know 
proposition, but he did give in and he broke up with Nancy and basically mm. said, OK, you know what? I'm going to focus on us. And, you know, and it, they have a teenage daughter at this point, too. So it's like you have to consider her as well. And so he's like, all right, break it off with Nancy. Get back together with Ellen only. You try said, see this. See an ants. See an ants. Try this monogamy thing. So in August of 1985, uh, when Ellen is five and a half months pregnant with their son, Ed is getting ready for his annual boys trip. It's a sailing <laughs> trip that M is on. No, I'm just kidding. M wasn't invited. I would like to go to the after brunch, however. <laughs> you are the bartender on the yacht. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sign me up. Sure. I'm as your as assistant I'm to taste yeah. test all the beverages. It's perfect. <laughs> What could I mean, go wrong? <laughs> we would do a great job of working a bar together, I think. I think we'd fucking nail it. Except I mean, after Christine, you're... is this mimo- mimosa too too full of alcohol or what? <laughs> and I'd say, no such thing. Um, <laughs> and then it would be the grog shop all over again. And we have, uh, that Karen lady would be so rude, you know. I actually, I have a Karen shift. Karen 3000. I have a shift at the bar later tonight. So I'm, You I'm do? Looking, I know. I'm pretty excited. i you I'm tell have... that little witch that I am got my eye on her. <laughs> and when I see her now, because my I turned my microphone off, every time she walks up to the bar, I go, "Ugh, what do yeah. you want?" <laughs> and then you turn it back on. You're like, "Lovely to see you again." <laughs> I'm like, "Hey, girl!" <laughs> oh, this fucking bitch! I can't yeah. with Karen three thousand. She drives me crazy. Me too. Uh, okay, so. In any case, uh, he's on this sailing trip with his friends. It's like they call it a boys trip. Every year they go on it. They go sailing together. It's just, you know, broing out on the ocean with your Connecticut pals. I assume everyone's wearing loafers. I don't know. Or what are they called? Boat shoes. Whatever. Sperry's. Sperry's. Oh, Didn't you God. go to private school? I Come did. On. I hated those. <laughs> Oh, Sperry's. And then everyone wore moccasins, which now I'm like, oh, God. I was I was unfortunately one of those people. And now I hate myself. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a bad look looking back and being like, oh, no, <laughs> some oh, of this stuff. Oh, uh, half the things I ever did. I'm like, oh, no. Um, mm-hmm. I was always jealous of the kids with Sperry's. I never got any. And now that now, thank God I didn't. Isn't that because... funny? All the popular girls were Sperry's. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> now it's like, oh, God. Sperry's in the summer, Uggs in the winter. And then. Uh, <laughs> really telling on myself from an early age i pretty much consistently wore birkenstocks so oh there you go i (laughs) I mean i did too but i got mocked relentlessly for it so um (laughs) it was either rainbow sandals or birkenstocks every single day of my entire middle school and high school damn pretty much and then i got edgy and i wore converse i was gonna say i wore converse and everyone was like oh my god yeah because i didn't have sperry's or moccasins i had (laughs) converse Okay, here we go. Uh, so they're going on this boys trip in their Sperry's. And on Friday, August 2nd, it is Ed's birthday. So what does that make him? A Leo? Sure. Is that right? You just said sure, like you're just humoring me. I uh, Leo always throws me. I think oh, it's, yes. Is it early? No, because I always mix it up with Virgo. It's late It's September. July, August. No, it's July, July August. August. Yeah. Yeah, Leo always confuses me. I think that's right. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I my mom's a Leo kid. and she's August it... 16th. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. trust you. Okay. That's really dangerous, but okay. You do you. Okay. Um, anyway. So Friday, August 2nd, uh, as we said, Ed is a Leo and it is the eve of this big boating boys trip. Mm. So he spends a day with Ellen, who again is five and a half months pregnant with their son and their daughter, Jessica. Meanwhile, who's a teenager is away at summer camp. So 7 p.m. that night on his birthday, Ed's friend Roger Peterson picked Ed up from his house and they all met up with the other sailors, sailor boys (laughs) at, uh, at one of their friends' houses is where they were all congregating. Then the four friends the next day would drive to Maine, pick up a sailboat, as you do, and then Mm -hmm. sail for 10 days. Wow, it's so, a long time. It's a long time to be on a boat, oh my God, in my I opinion. Was like 10 hours. I was <laughs> like, that's... 10 hours I can maybe do, but <laughs> yeah. 10 days. Um, so this is their big plan. And that evening, as they're all gathered at their friend's house, Ed calls Ellen from the friend's landline. And he calls to check in. Uh, he says, hey, by the way, there's something. Could I ask you to, like, 
put something away on the boat that I left at home. You know, he's asking her to kind of run one more errand that he forgot to do. And he wants to check in, obviously, because she's pregnant and uh, everything seems fine. Uh, They have, you know, their fun little night. And then the next day they set off to Maine and head out to sea. But according to Ed's friends, uh, he seemed pretty anxious about leaving Ellen at home while pregnant, understandably. Mm -hmm. And so he had this ship to shore radio. And so he was trying to get a hold of her, trying to get in contact with her. um, But every time he called, there was no answer at home. Mm. And so he tried this over and over until he got so worried that he contacted their friend Len. Remember Len? I remember Len. To go check on Nancy. And Len arrives, and the door oh. is locked. Oh, shit. That's not normal. Is that Len not a red would know. Len would fucking know. Red flag central. Oy. Yes. He arrives, and the damn door is locked. And he's like, this is already weird. What's even weirder is that all the lights are on, and the air condition- he can hear the air conditioning running, but nobody's answering the door when he knocks. So, eventually, uh, he found an unlocked window he had to climb inside the house and upstairs len found ellen in her bedroom and she was dead Mm. he immediately called 911 and when police arrived it initially looked like she had been raped and that's because she was on the bed but her pajamas all the blankets were on the floor her underpants had been ripped and there were strangulation marks on her neck and so, of course, detectives immediately suspect Ellen must have known her killer because, you know, the door was locked. It uh, didn't look like any sign of forced entry. There was no sign of struggle within the house itself. Mm-hmm. And the only fingerprints they found were hers, her husband's, and Len's. Okay. So there was also nothing stolen. So they were like, well, it's not a burglary. So they're trying to get to the bottom of this, and they try to determine a uh, time of death. So the medical examiner ruled that Ellen had been murdered between 8 p.m. Friday night and 8 a.m. Sunday morning. So that leaves like all 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. So 8 p.m. Friday, but then Mm -hmm. 8 a.m. Sunday. So that like like a 48 hour all of Saturday. I think it's like what's in between that 36 hours. Thirty-six. Yeah. So, yeah, 36 hour window. And they're saying that is the time of death. Well, that timeline cleared Ed because he left Friday evening at seven. Mm. And oh, wow. Okay. So, yes, right on the dot. (laughs) So, like, he left an hour before this supposed window. So, the medical examiner and assistant determined that she had been strangled by her own underwear uh, based Mm. on the ligature patterns on her neck, which matched if you pulled the, they showed it on the forensic files, if you pull the elastic, like the marks on it were the same as on her neck. Really disturbing. Um, But when they looked at the actual cause of death, it was not that she had been strangled by her underwear. It was that she had been strangled by hand. Somebody had manually strangled her um, and they found broken cartilage in her neck. That was only possible if she had been strangled with somebody's hand. Oh, God. Okay. And when they did an autopsy, they found no evidence of rape either. So it almost looked like someone was staging a sex crime. Okay. Because they took the underwear and put it, you know, made it look like that was used to strangle her. That wasn't actually. It was probably placed there after her death. So it Mm -hmm. looked almost like somebody was staging this to look like uh, a sexual assault case when it really wasn't. So police contacted Ed with that ship to shore radio and they broke the news of his wife's death. And oh, so imagine hearing ima- that in the middle on of your the boys ocean trip. Oh, my God. It's horrific. You're and you're in the already of the worried. Ocean. Like I would feel so claustrophobic. Like I couldn't get. <gasps> you would. Yeah. You're like trapped. And also, also, I don't know anything about sailboats. But in my mind, they're the fucking slowest way to get back to shore. Yeah, and they're so, not like, quick. So in my mind, I'm like, you obviously want to get back as soon as you can and like to just be like you're all stuck like slowly yeah like and what are your friends supposed home. to do be like it's okay buddy do you want a brewski like what a horrible yeah. situation for everybody yeah so they tell him this horrible news of course and they are able to direct this boat of friends to a coast guard office in woods hole massachusetts and connecticut state police actually met them there so len who had found uh Ellen's body 
was a suspect, of course, mm -hmm. because he was her best friend, former who lover. Who she slept with, yeah. Who she, yep. And uh, he was the one to discover the body. So, of course. And he was the one to say, you better keep your door you locked. You better lock your doors. <laughs> Great point. Great yeah. point. So police thought Len seemed like Ellen's confidant. Um, he told investigators all about the Sherman's marriage because he was also a really close friend of Ellen. So he kind of knew the troubles they were facing and all this. Um, and they worked together because their businesses kind of overlapped. So they had a very close relationship. But when they're looking at Len, they just could not find a motive. They were like, we just don't know why he would do this. It doesn't really add up. And they even went so far as to exhume Ellen's body. This is really hard, oh. but to do a paternity test using fetal bone DNA from the baby to test whose child it was. And it was Ed's child. So there was okay. no confusion of like, maybe it was Len's kid, you know, but um, it was Ed's child. Uh, that part really got to me. Yeah, that's rough. But uh, Len cooperated fully. He told police everything that happened, everything he knew. Um, he, you know, didn't seem to have anything to hide. And one thing that he mentioned, uh, which stuck out as strange to him is that the air conditioner was on full blast when he arrived um, and it was so cold in the room that there was ice residue on the vent of the air conditioner oh it was to keep the body cold yeah well, you've been watching some law and order what's going on i'm just the smartest one in the room as we discussed <laughs> That's earlier all right why do That's i keep all. forgetting probably because i'm so dumb <laughs> <laughs> okay so hold that thought emothy okay so the medical examiners including celebrity medical examiner dr henry lee uh who i i know pretty well from all the true crime documentaries i watch uh began to suspect that the cool conditions of the room had slow decomp and the process of rigor mortis but unfortunately len and the paramedics had left the door open, obviously, because they're trying to get, you know, yeah. helps and services in. Um, and so they were not able to determine what the actual temperature in the room was when her body was in there. So they can't right. really scientifically, like, prove how slow the decomp was or anything like that. They can only kind of assume that maybe that's what happened. So the medical examiners decide to evaluate the state. This is pretty gnarly, folks. If you have, like, a gag reflex just hold on tight uh so they evaluated the state of ellen's stomach contents and she had had linguine with tomato and clam sauce okay and the linguine was intact so she had just eaten correct man okay. you are move aside dr henry lee damn it's me it's me the mensa kid me okay ed was in mensa so maybe you are friends i mean we've definitely like exchanged contact info but yeah well apparently he was kind of a douche he told everyone how smart he was so my i have a few family members in mensa i obviously did not get their genes um but <laughs> yes, you uh, did you're very come on but they're all assholes, all the ones that are in Mensa. I just so. like, I don't know if you ever listened to the Jamie Loftus podcast. Um, and I just saw her live too. But uh, my year in Mensa, she does like a podcast oh, really? about just her a year. She got into Mensa and then like went to all the meetings. And it's just, I mean, it's bonkers. Um, but if you yeah. want like some gossip about what happens inside yes. the Mensa group, like that's a I great do. show to listen to. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm sure there's some lovely people in Mensa, but I am not related to any of them. Yeah. So. Yeah. I don't even want to know what my IQ is, you know, let's just leave it at that. I, I just like, if I'm average, that's, I'm going to call it a high. Let's, I'm call let's it a fucking, win. it's a win. Yeah. We should take me Mensa too. tests together sometime. No, it'd be so bad. Cause you'd be like <laughs> three points higher and you'd never let me live I already down. know your book smart the in the smarter one between the two of us but don't i don't th i don't know about that it's like book smart only because you hate reading famously so there's not even i, I don't I know i really i was uh, growing up i was always a b plus average student me too best. <laughs> oh maybe but i don't even think that has let's yeah let's ride too. this ride let's light this I candle say i was always a b student um yeah maybe maybe we maybe we have the same exact iq wouldn't that be cool what was your sat score Oh, I don't remember because it was that time when they switched the numbers. Yeah, we were in that like weird three year that period. Phase. Yeah. Um, Either think... way, mine was bad. 
I don't remember. I know I got a five on the AP English exam and my teacher accused me of cheating because I had a B in her class. I got a one on AP Gov, which is like the easiest of APs. (laughs) No. I was the only person in my grade and like for several years to come, I was the only one who got a a one. And he even said like, you have to try Try to to get a one. You have to try to get a one to be like everyone gets fours or fives. And I was like, okay. And I got a one. It's like, (laughs) how (laughs) did you just not fill it out? I don't know. I really, I don't know. I think I never learned how to properly study because I would study so fucking hard for tests and it would (laughs) always be like absolutely the wrong material. (laughs) So I would study really hard and then none of those, the questions. Do you remember that happened one time? You and I in grad school. I still remember you spent all night at this whiteboard, like writing these crazed, like Charlie-esque like (laughs) strings. And like the next day we took the test and you like failed it. Oh, failed with like, with like, it, it, what's it called? Like a flying glowing, colors. Flying colors. I mean, I, it was like single digits, I think was. No, I think you literally score. got like a seven. I think so. I think seven <laughs> Sorry. was. Sorry. I just remember like that class was so scary and hard and everybody was like, she was everyone like. Everyone failed. She was but like 40% failed. of you failed. And she's like that. And I'm like, but isn't that on the teacher at that point? Like 40% of the class failed. I know. Not everyone failed. You got to like a normal grade, right? You got like a B. I got a 90, but I kept saying I got a B because everybody else was like. Because you were the one who like, we couldn't curve our grade because you were something. Yeah, I didn't want to piss it. So you got a 90 and I got a seven and we're wondering (laughs) who would be better on but i don't think any of those things would be on the mensa exam i don't know what is on the mensa exam but i'm sure like the history of sesame street is not on it okay <laughs> also by the way if it was the history of sesame street i would have gotten you an a. nailed it i don't know what i'm talking about i don't even remember what it was on but i don't either it was it was about like <laughs> it, it, i don't remember what it was about it was but i so- Whatever I thought it was about was not it. She she literally was looked at us and was like, I've never been so disappointed in my life. And we were like, oh, my God. And like, I know I wasn't like, I don't even think I was a bad student because I did no. try really hard. And just no, nothing she taught clicked with me. And to this day, I blame her. I, <laughs> I mean, totally to be honest, if 40% of the class fails an exam, there's some disconnect. You know, I don't I'm not saying it's like all her fault, but like there's some disconnect between the material and you know i'm just saying i also remember that was the class where the guy who created the big bear in the big blue house came and i was so stoked I literally and think about this all the time everyone looked at me like i was a crazy person and i was like i are we definitely not fucking, i was, was like are we not in a television program i'm supposed to be jazzed about this i think shit. i was pretty rude to you too about that not rude but i was like whoa you're excited like i don't know See, I, I don't know if you were but i've never but seen I'll, that show so i think for me i was like i don't understand a lot of people like gave me like weird comments about it and like I was the only person who seemed really stoked and then the guy who created Bear in the Big Blue House even seemed weird that I was excited and I was like why the fuck did you come here then don't you want people I to be excited that you're everybody, here I, th- I wonder if people thought you were just kind of like being facetious like you were trying to be like no I was so excited I, kn- I was no, like, now knowing you I know that but I wonder if from the outside people were like are you pulling well, also- our leg well, half of our class were a bunch of like, I mean, we were in a film and TV program. Half Don't of people were me. like film douches. And yeah. so when I was like, wow, like you're, I'm getting to meet you. Like, this is such a cool part of this program. I'm so glad I'm here. And everyone and was like, like, where's Alfred you? Hitchcock? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm sorry, but this is a show I watched as a little kid. Like, shut the fuck up. I'm allowed to also, be excited about Also, I think I was this. like, how old are you? Because that was a show my sister watched. And I was like, are you 12? Like, how are you in this program? I but used I, to wake I, I used to wake up really early and I just put on whatever was on TV and that just happened to be on TV. But I always liked it. I always thought it was nice. Oh, well, it's a good show. Now I feel bad about that because I think I was kind of like because I thought you were kind of kidding. I think I really didn't know if you were serious or not. Like, because we never I don't think we'd ever seen you really ecstatic about something. And so that something was bare in the big blue house. And we were like is em pulling our leg or are you serious i think it was also a show i had actually heard of because i was oh, not part maybe, of like yeah. the film douche oh, crew geez. where they would all talk about like wes anderson and this bullshit and i was like okay and like then i heard about like a childhood show that had some nostalgia to it and i was like yeah. so excited and i'm anyway. sorry if i was part of that i don't really remember but Me if either. i was i do it's apologize fine. um i was not trying to be to 
ruin your spirits. They probably wondered like what my story was since I was getting sevens on the tests and I was excited about <laughs> the Big Blue House. I mean, I feel like... like you were presenting a really interesting <laughs> narrative about yourself and we were all trying to get kind of put our finger like, on it. People should have gotten it from the beginning. Like, I'm a little stupid, but I'm excited to be you're here. Not... Like... <laughs> you're so not stupid. That's the thing. Okay. Uh, anyway. Uh, back to murder. I'm sorry. Yeah, he was in Mensa, which I don't even know if it's in these notes, but he was. Just fun fact. Uh, so in any case, um, let's find out where we are. Uh, they right, left. Right. The, oh, the oh, oh, my God. Here it is. They uh, had to analyze her stomach contents. And Linguini. yeah, if you were trying to fast forward through that, you're still not <laughs> over it. Sorry, it's still happening. Uh, the linguine in her tummy. And it was uh intact and so like you said that indicated she had eaten it pretty recently and so it turns out she had eaten that on friday with her co-workers for lunch so now they're trying to figure out well how long would it have stayed intact after lunch on friday uh in right. order to stay intact by the time her body was or like until when she died does that make sense yeah okay so do you want to know how they tested it can you guess <laughs> I mean, I would guess they would just replicate it and put it like they would make an, someone else eat it and then, I don't know, x-ray them or something to see. Like, make them throw it up. Make them throw it up. Interesting. Yeah. Which okay, is that so makes sense. gross. Throwing up spaghetti. Like who clams. volunteered for that job? though? That's you know? what I was wondering, because several people ate like participated. They had living subjects eat the same meal, which is like clams and. And then you, and then they made them throw it up. That's a and bad they, thing to throw up too. It's clams bad. Is rough. Like you probably would never eat clams again. Like I mean, it's already a rough food to like get on board with. Um, but so then they kind of timed out how long it took for this food to digest. Mm -hmm. So if you threw it up and it was still intact, then you know could have been in the window where she died. So they did this and they determined that complete digestion of this meal would take only four hours. Okay, so they're thinking by, so four hours from when they found her from, then? Four hours from when she ate it at lunch. And four hours later, it would have digested in her body. So within that window, since it was still intact, she, is, she was murdered in that window. So are they saying that she was then murdered on Sunday since it was still intact in her stomach? Or so like, the, I guess it wouldn't have digested if your body so Friday, stopped working. So Friday... Yeah, so she ate the meal Friday for lunch. Okay, so it was on Friday that she She died. had to d have died within four hours. Otherwise, when they found her body days later, it would have been digested. But gotcha. since it was still intact, that means she died within four hours of eating that meal. Got it. I was confused. In my mind, her body was still digesting With things even though she died. I totally yeah. get what you're saying. Yeah, when they found it. Yeah. Okay, so Friday between 12 and 4. Right. Yes. So okay. or whenever lunch was to four hours later. Yeah. Mm hmm. Now, guess what? Ed's alibi is fucking falling apart, my friend, because right, he, he left at seven. Uh huh. Left at seven. And so now suddenly her time of death was smack dab right in the middle of Ed being home. Right before he conveniently left for a 10 day trip for yeah. a 10 day trip. Also, it was his birthday, which like isn't really relevant, but just kind of fucking sucks, too. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, what are you doing? It's yeah. your birthday, you asshole. But it also makes his alibi look worse because you'd think you'd be with your wife on your birthday. Yes, that's true, too. And uh, and he was with his wife on his birthday. On, and he just pretended like, OK, anyway, yes, you're exactly right. So his alibi is starting to fall apart. But again, there's no like real ironclad evidence yet. Then a witness comes forward and says, hey, I, I don't know if this is relevant at all, but I had a really weird encounter with Ed. Uh, Saturday morning before he left for Maine. Okay. And they're like, okay, what is it? Turns out she was at the video rental store and he was either returning a movie or picking up a movie, but uh, he said, oh, I just watched this great film. I highly recommend it. And they, they knew each other. So she, you know, said, hi, how are you? And he said, oh, I have a great recommendation for this movie. It's called Blackout. I just watched it. It's awesome. And she's like, oh, great. Thanks for letting me know. Well, let me tell you the plot of Blackout. Okay. In Blackout, a man murders his wife and children and then puts them in a room with the air conditioner on full blast to slow decomposition and confuse the forensics team about time of death. <laughs> Goodbye. That's weird. That'll, that'll do it. What a weird coincidence. 
So Ed told the woman he really enjoyed this movie. She had to watch it, which like, what a fucking dumbass. Like if she yeah. hadn't come forward with that information, nobody would have known he even rented it. It's one of those things where like all information is useful, even yes. if you don't realize it. You'd be like, why would that matter? But look, like it matters a lot. Yeah. And so, you know, things are just looking worse and worse for Ed. And he starts falling back on his like ironclad, what he thinks is ironclad alibi of having called Ellen the night before he left sailing. And he was at his friend's house and he used the landline to check up on her, see how she's doing, tell her to run an errand. And his friends were all there and it was at his friend's house. So he's like, you guys saw me on the phone with her. And they're thinking like, I mean, yeah, we did. So you know, we don't know what to make of this. And this is still a really solid defense. Four people can say, I, or three people, I guess, can say, yeah, we all saw him talking to her on the phone. So investigators are tr scrambling to put together some sort of motive as to why he would do this. And according to Len, their sort of like inside source, uh, despite their initial reconciliation, Ed was still kind of trying to see Nancy and mm. keep her in the loop uh, and still trying to balance both families. And Ellen was on the verge of divorcing him. So things were rocky. She decided, apparently, according to Len, that he would never, that Ed would never be a fully involved husband and father. And she was fed up with his lifestyle. And she alleged that he could, quote, keep nancy and his sailboat and she was going to take everything else oh wow okay including the house so she was basically like you can have your girlfriend on the boat i get the business because it's her business she sure you know it's both of their business but she does a majority of the work uh and she owned a majority of the business and she was like i'm gonna take the business over and i'm gonna take the house and you can go off with your girlfriend and your boat and apparently that was not something he wanted to hear mm. So Ed, who worked at the community college, knew that his life would change dramatically because his salary was nothing compared to what Ellen brought into the family. And so he was kind of stuck. And he apparently also said that he was very angry Ellen was making him choose between her and Nancy. Uh, and, you know, I can see why that would anger you, but like you kind of put yourself in this predicament, my friend. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Ed belonged to Mensa. Uh, and one friend, apparently it was in my notes, one friend said, Ed liked to make people feel that he was smarter than you. Ed thought he could have whatever Ed wanted. So in a certain way, people were like, this guy just thinks, oh, I know how to solve this problem. Uh, and he could be pushy, he could be arrogant, and he could be violent. So people were starting to turn on him and think like, well... Maybe he did do it. And the narrative around this became Ed must have killed Ellen because he refused to give up Nancy, his lifestyle and their business and the income that came with it. And throughout the investigation, his friends who supported him in the beginning, they really thought he couldn't have done this. They're starting to get more and more uncomfortable because he is being a big weirdo and he's asking them questions like, hey, do you know how bodies decompose? And they're like, why are you uh, asking us that? Like, like why? I'm just going to jot that down in case yeah. I ever need to know. That. Let me see the timestamp on that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And he's asking, like, do you know how they determine time of death? Like, he's just not being sneaky at all. And one but also, like, hello, it's the classic arrogant confidence yes. of, like, I'm smarter than you. I can get away with it. And I can go to Blockbuster Hollywood Video and say, rent this movie. It's great. Wink. And think no yeah, one's going to figure it out. Like, come on. I mean, that feels like such an intentional dig because he could right? just not fucking said anything. You couldn't. You could have just been like, oh, I don't know what the name of the movie was. Doesn't matter. Like, yeah. why? Why make it a thing? So another thing his friends started to kind of remember is that on the boat mm -hmm. on the first day, he was wearing long pants and a full turtleneck. And everyone else, it's August, everyone's like burning up. So they're all in shorts and t-shirts. And they were like, it was so weird. He was in like, f he covered all of his body. Oh, and, and he had like defensive wounds. So they don't know. Because again, like nobody so. had hardcore evidence. I don't mean to say hardcore evidence, but they didn't have that either. They didn't have any hard evidence. And so they were just like, well, he was wearing a turtleneck, which doesn't prove anything, but it's also fishy. And... I'm you're not going to like this M when they found Ellen her fingernails had bent backward <gasps> 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh my god. Oh my god. From what? From like trying to scratch him? Yeah. Like that's defa- like. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm sorry. That's a rough one. I'm sorry. Oh my god. And like also like like my own issues aside. Like imagine how scared you must I know. be where you're I scratching know. that hard. I know. I know. It's horrible. It's horrible. Oh my god. Oh my god. I can. F- oh my god. I'm wow. sorry. It's- Terrible. I'm sorry. But on that note, it's how they knew that whoever had killed her had defensive wounds. And so, of course, now it was too late to prove that he had any. But it's still shady that he was wearing like a turtleneck and mm-hmm. long pants on an August day on a boat. So, you know, it was just odd. And so his friends are starting to think like, this is getting weird. Um, even the air conditioner evidence was shaky because like they didn't know how cold the room really had been. There were no conclusive studies that this would actually work. Um, and so it was all kind of up in the air and they were like, we, we really think he did it. We just don't have anything to pin it on him. Fast forward to March of 1990. This is five years after the murder and Ed is still running around living life. Okay. And suddenly a new witness statement comes, comes forward. What? Who? So one of Ed's friends is driving his daughter, I don't know where, to volleyball, to school, I have no idea. And she's in the backseat. And he's discussing Ed's biggest defense that he had spoken to Ellen on the phone with his friends Friday night. And that was at his house. So the guy driving is like talking to his daughter. and He's like, man, we all saw him on the phone. Like, we know he called. And the daughter in the backseat speaks up. And she says, well. I never really thought about it because she was so little back then. But she said it was the weirdest thing. I picked up the phone to call a friend and I Mm. heard Ed talking to nobody on the phone. Oh, my God. She said the phone line was just ringing and he was saying, "Okay, I love you, honey. Can you make sure to how are you feeling? You know, he's asking all these questions. And so all his friends are like, oh, well, he's on the phone with his wife. She goes, well, actually, I picked up the phone to call a friend and heard him talking and realized it was so weird. He's talking to an empty line. Ew. Yeah. So wait, did he not realize that like someone had picked up on the other no, end? No, he didn't. She was in a different room because it's like a landline. So she had just wow. she just happened to pick the phone up. And thank God, because that she... was like almost like a like a fate moment of Right. Like... She's like, I should really call my friend Sue. Yeah. It's really, really <laughs> on my mind for some reason. Yeah, it's so weird. Um, but yeah, so she just happened to pick up the phone. And since she was so little back then, it really didn't click until years later when her dad is saying you know it's so weird we saw him on the phone and he was talking to ellen and she goes actually he wasn't talking to ellen he was talking to no one so of course now apparently the dad almost crashes his car because he's like what like he yeah almost crashes his car this is so shocking to him and so he calls police immediately to report his daughter's statement and now That's kind of the last remaining thread of Ed's alibi or of Ed's story that she was still alive when he left. And, like, he can't talk his way out of this one, you know what I mean? Like, now he can't prove that she was actually there and still alive. So police went to Ed's office and finally felt like they had enough to arrest him for first degree murder. And he sold the family graphic design business in order to afford his defense team. Damn. I know. And the trial began October of 91, which was a little over six years since Ellen had been killed. And Ed the whole time maintained his innocence. He was extremely confident to the point of being cocky. He even laughed and made jokes throughout the trial. Uh, And the teenage witness who's, you know, was a child when this uh, phone call occurred, she was equally confident on the stand about the fake phone call. Like she did not back down when when the you know, opposing side was saying, well, are you sure? And she's like, nope. She insisted what she heard, uh, even when they were pressuring her um, in cross-examination. But still, it just wasn't enough because even though this like cold room theory was being presented, they even showed clips from the movie Blackout to be like, look how similar this is. 
but there's still that lingering doubt because none of it is like hard hitting enough to, yeah. to nail him. And so they didn't have the like scientific backing that they needed to really like prove that rigor mortis was delayed and all that. But the pasta evidence was more compelling. You know, they're saying mm -hmm. she had to have died within four hours. And then there was also the fact that Ed had a history of domestic abuse. Oh, shit. Okay. Yep. So before the trial began, prosecution was actually barred from using Ed's violent history as evidence uh, because previous abuse, according to the judge, didn't you know prove he was guilty of this particular crime and they thought it would just sway the jury. Um, so they ended up ruling out a previous case where Ed had strangled a woman in the 1970s. Oh, my God. They also ruled out police records of Ed abusing his girlfriend, Nancy Prescott, and the now mother of his child. And apparently he had once kicked her in the face so hard she called the police on him. And they <gasps> had photographs of her swollen face and injuries, but they, again, couldn't use these in court against him. Oh, my him. God. But thank God, Nancy decided to testify against him in trial. And she told all about his violent nature, his history of physical abuse. So this is like, talk about character. You know, yeah. this is like showing his real character and was very damning. What makes me sad is that Ed's daughter, was, who was 19 at this point and yeah. had been 13 when her mother was killed, uh, came forward to testify on behalf of the, of the defense. So like on her father's defense which mm. just makes me sad it just seems like a horrible position to be in yeah and also it makes you wonder like so wait against him or for him for him for him i wonder if um if he really was violent if she was also like threatened into it yeah who knows or or uh, yeah i don't know it's hard to say especially because like she had or one she could have been like parent yeah i was gonna say she could just be like this is my last parent i just want I don't want to lose I, both or, or I something. want to believe that he didn't do it or yeah, who knows? <sighs> um, just a really tough position to be in. Um, so the prosecution attorney cross examined Ed for days um, and their goal was to keep him on the stand for as long as possible. So jurors could see the quote unquote real him. Mm -hmm. And smart. so it is smart. Yeah, I totally agree. So in the end, the jury sided with the circumstantial evidence and the witness statements and found him guilty of first degree murder. And he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. And Nancy, the girlfriend, attended the sentencing hearing. Um, she didn't want to be there, but she this is really sweet, wanted to support Jessica, the, the, the daughter. So like her boyfriend's daughter. OK. Jessica, who um, like stood on the stand as defense for her dad and everything okay so okay. uh nancy wanted to support jessica which i thought was really sweet so i, I do hope there's some connection there i know that's probably yeah. awkward because like it's your dad's lover so to speak but yeah. i don't know I I, I I would like to think worse has happened in this exact yeah. situation so i know i feel like maybe she took her under her wing i don't know i don't know that's i'd like to live in that fantasy world yeah um, so she had, uh, so Nancy attended, even though she didn't want to, but she wanted to be there for Jessica. And so she attended and she apparently said she resented the way the media had covered the case um, regarding both Jessica and her own child oh, and okay. had sucked both of these kids into this fucking drama, you know, that like they weren't part of. And so she just resented how like they were treated by the media, Jessica and her own child. And so she attended Ed at the sentencing hearing, like we said, was sentenced to 50 years in prison. And this is when, for the first time ever, he apologized to Ellen's family, but not for the killing because he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But for the way that he acted when Ellen was alive. So he did show some remorse. He said okay. she deserved a better life than the one she shared with me. For that, I will be eternally sorry. But he also said, but I don't know who killed her. So. Kind of, kind of, hmm. It was only three years into his 50 year prison sentence that Ed died of a heart attack at only 52 years old. Oh, damn. Yeah. So really kind of jarring. Um, in 2019, Dr. Henry Lee, the celebrity medical examiner, and who was also the lead Emmy on this case, was caught in a controversy because two men he helped convict in the 80s who had been in prison for years were exonerated because his evidence had been flawed in those cases. 
Apparently, uh, Dr. Lee had tested a towel for blood at the scene of the crime instead of using a laboratory test, and he falsely concluded there was blood on the towel, and this evidence ended up convicting both men or helped to convict both men of murder. Oh, wow. And when they tested the blood or the towel in a lab later, they found there was no blood on this towel. And that was like one of the major points that sent these men to prison. So, you know, it, of course, led people, and we've seen this before, to wonder whether Dr. Lee had maybe messed up some other evidence on the... Yeah, it only takes the... one time to ruin your credibility. Yeah, yeah exactly. And he had done 8,000 investigations. So, like, people were thinking, well, is are any of these now flawed? But Dr. Lee maintains this was a one-time mistake and that he agreed with the exoneration uh of the other two men and he fully admitted that he had screwed that up and he said i otherwise uphold all of my testimonies so you know jeez who knows about that um but of course ed has passed so he obviously can't appeal but an investigation could theoretically be opened if you know somebody does want to prove that this was all done falsely and somebody else killed her but at this point you know it probably like that's won't happen. <laughs> yeah. So Ed maintained his innocence to his death. Um, but most people, including the people in his life, still consider him to be guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still, some people wonder, you know, did he really do it? If not, who did? A 2017 review of the case in the Journal of Forensic Science and Criminal Investigation stated that the case demonstrated why crime scene procedures are so important to follow, which we yeah. see all the freaking time and the Mullane, John Mullaney bit of like sweep up that blood. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I have a hunch. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Forget it. Forget the fingerprints. And so, you know, if paramedics and police had shut the bedroom door, which I didn't even know was a thing that was part of crime scene protocol, but apparently they were supposed to shut the door to preserve the scene. Uh, and they are supposed to take environmental parameters like room temperature, which I also didn't know. I so, didn't know that. you know, fun fact for you there. But, you know, if they had done that, it probably would have been more reliable um, to be able to test how long, you know till rigor mortis and all that so that is the case i mean you know he basically based his uh murder on a movie that he got at hollywood video or you know who knows where can you imagine being the director of that movie though being like oh fuck yeah it's horrible and i read an article from god it must have been the 90s about uh the sentencing and in i think it was new york times and in that article it said uh ed sherman who was known to love solving mysteries on weekly crime shows so like he would watch those crime shows and try to solve them and like prove that he could because you know he's in mensa and all that of course of course yeah i uh yeah i wonder at, at some point i feel like Maybe it's on a Law & Order episode and I just haven't seen it yet that I feel like a true crime podcaster will be the killer of a true crime or something. Oh, I think you know? that is an episode. It has to be, right? No, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And I'm, I'm uh, let me see it. Cause I think somebody funny play or maybe, hmm. It just, it's I'll, a perfect, the perfect plot. I'll think about it. I feel like, uh, I feel like that was definitely maybe not Law and Order, but one of these crime shows definitely did podcaster, which was kind of hilarious. Yeah. Well, great story. We both had messy ones today. I guess. I mean, talk about frenemies and lovers, ex lovers, and and boats and do sperries. We have, do you have any update on like the daughter? Like, is she okay these days? Um, I don't know. And you know, she was nineteen when the trial happened in nineteen ninety. Okay, so. She's not a teenager 50s. anymore. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I mean, I, I hope she's okay. Yeah, um, me too. I'm sure well, you wouldn't be okay in a lot of ways. Yeah. As whatever but, okay means. Yeah, exa- yeah. yeah exactly. Um, um, I hope she's found healing. Let's put it that way. Good. Yeah. I Yeah. Great story, though, Christine. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I really mean, thought the whole time it was going to be the his his ex-lover <gasps> who, like, wanted... Nancy? Yeah, I, th- I thought originally you were going to say it was Nancy who like wanted him all to herself and then oh. knew that he knew that he was on a trip and so she went over. Oh, well in the there. SVU episode and she didn't know not to unlock the door. Yeah, you know? that's what I thought. Yeah. Mm. Oh well. Well, I'm just glad we've got an answer. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Christine. Those are some those are some good stories we covered. What a doozy. Uh 
thank you everyone for listening so far and uh if you would like to continue uh <laughs> enjoying our voices you can find us on youtube you can find us on patreon you can find us live in your town except right now it's just a vega show and then that uh, was actually, only to Zach Bagans, live yeah. in your town, if you are Zach Bagans. <laughs> but we will soon be coming out with uh, more show dates and all that kind of stuff, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and we do a an after chat on Patreon every episode where the following day we release a video, a YouTube video of us just decompressing after after a normal episode and the last talking one was, all sorts of things the last one was almost as long as a normal episode it was intense yeah it was really long <laughs> we really got into it so maybe that'll happen again but hop on over if you want to i'll bring hear my more of us pen. <laughs> yeah i'll bring the mensa tests yeah oh my god let's find out our IQs <laughs> on an after chat all right and <laughs> that's why we drink <laughs>